And thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 72, Taranto, Part 3. As the attack from the first wave was coming to a close over the harbor, the second wave was launching into the wind. These nine planes would be led by Lieutenant Commander Ginger Hale, but luck wasn't with the second wave. As the last two aircraft were maneuvering towards the center line of the deck in preparation to take off, their wings came together and locked up. Both pilots, experienced enough not to panic, shut down their engines, and the fitters nearby pushed the planes backwards to unlock their wings. One plane seemed fine, but the other had a torn wing. Through the hole in the fabric, two broken ribs were visible. The undamaged plane soon took off to join the others, circling overhead, confused by the delay. They waited a few more minutes for the last plane to take off, but instead saw the bridge flash the Morse signal to carry on. So the eight planes formed up and headed north. The damaged craft, L-5F, was taken down to the hangar deck, but the pilot and observer were not ready to be counted out and begged for a quick repair. As that situation was being discussed on board, the other plane from the incident, seemingly undamaged, suddenly had its own situation. L-5Q was now 30 miles from Illustrious when something began banging against the fuselage. It seemed to be coming from the extra fuel tank. Then the engine stopped running for a moment, and the pilot, Lieutenant Morford, angled down to keep wind flowing over the wings and thus keep control. With that done, Morford switched to his internal tank, hoping there was no trouble with that, and restarted his engine. It came to life, and he regained control. But there was no way he could risk himself, his other crew, Sub-Lieutenant Green, and the plane by continuing the mission. They turned around and dejectedly headed back to the carrier. But as Morford started his landing approach, the guns from Illustrious and another ship opened up, their tracers and shells coming at the swordfish. Morford quickly turned away, but had the presence of mind to ask, in rather colorful language, what those below were thinking. It then dawned on him that, although he had shot off the correct color flare, as he wasn't expected back this early, the carrier and the cruiser Berwick assumed he was the enemy and responded appropriately. Climbing out of range, Morford gave another indication signal and then slowly approached the carrier. This time, he was allowed to land. A little after 11 p.m., Hale and the seven aircraft with him, though still far away from Taranto, could see the flashing colored lights coming from the anti-aircraft fire. As they got closer, the diaphone picked up their plane's sound. The Italians knew they were coming. And right before their eyes, the tracers and shell bursts dramatically increased. They continued on, and right before midnight, two of Hale's accompanying aircraft, carrying flares, separated from the group. They flew over the east edge of the harbor to drop their 24 flares. In short order, the entire Mar Grande was alight. Staying focused on these two aircraft for a moment, after reaching the harbor's north shore, they then turned southeast and dashed for the oil storage depot at about the four o'clock position, but a bit more inland. They were rewarded with a post-drop fire that quickly spread. The reward for their success was to have even more guns focused on them for their departure. Still, they made it back to the illustrious without a single bullet hole. As for the five torpedo planes, they had also made for the north shore of Mar Grande, but further west, only to then turn southeast and fly right down the row of battleships and other large craft. Hale went in first. Starting his dive at 5,000 feet, he swayed side to side as best he could, trying desperately not to offer the guns below a stable target. He then leveled off at 30 feet above the waves and dropped his torpedo 700 yards away from the Littorio. Turning hard starboard, his swordfish almost ran into a barrage balloon cable, 
but then he turned left, now on a path for home. His torpedo had put a third hole in the unlucky Latorio. This rupture was 30 feet wide and 40 feet long. Next came Lieutenant G.W. Bailey. He decided to focus on the cruisers instead, hoping these less obvious targets would lead to less flak. But however it happened, after Bailey started his dive, his plane, along with his observer, Lieutenant H.J. Slaughter, was never seen again. Bailey's body was discovered the next day as the Italians began their post-attack cleanup. Lieutenant Leah came in next and decided to follow Hale's path, but then regretted his decision, watching the intensity of the tracers increase as they rose to find him. So he put his plane into a 360-degree turn, diving all the while. The idea was to gain speed to stay in front of everyone's aim and then level out just below the worst of the bullets flying through the air. His plan worked as he was relatively safe for a moment, until the gunners could adjust. But in that time, Leah focused on the Duilio and dropped his torpedo. Seeing it ram the battleship, Leah decided to stay low, flying in between two cruisers, but almost hitting a fishing vessel. He increased speed, keeping his plane just in front of the gunner's aim. Soon he was in the darkness. The Duilio now had a hole in it, 36 feet long and 24 feet wide. The water came rushing in. But the captain of the weakened vessel kept his head and ordered for the ship to be grounded. The Duilio gained speed and made for the nearest shore. By this point, Lieutenant Torrance Spence had flown over the north shore of the main harbor, turned around, and headed just south of the town along the canal. Before his dive, he and Bailey just managed to avoid ramming each other in the confused mess of bullets and searchlights filling the sky. By the time he pulled up from his dive, he was only three feet above the water. He let loose his torpedo at the Veneto, but as he didn't see an explosion, surmised that he either missed or the torpedo was defective. He survived the fire coming at him from all sides, as well as dipping one of his wheels into the water to disappear into the darkness to the south. Lieutenant Wilhelm came in next, but decided to look over the west side of the harbor, hoping for a respectable target without having to deal with the intense flak just to his east. But then he nearly ran into a balloon that had come loose from its cable. His reaction and resulting stunt practically stood the plane up on its nose, but it did the job, as contact was avoided with the wandering balloon. However, in his attempt to avoid a collision, he lost all speed. A relatively lucky shot then hit somewhere on the plane, and the controls were almost shaken out of his hand. He firmed his grip, but now found he couldn't lift the port wing. After ramming the controls for a few seconds, Wilhelm regained partial control. During all this, the plane was diving right at the town of Taranto. He turned right, did everything he could to lose speed, and then dropped his torpedo at the Veneto. His unusual flying had him under the concentration of flak, but now that the torpedo was gone, his plane lifted right into the thick of it. Wilhelm felt a second blow, but the plane still seemed to be under his control, so he climbed and made for the darkness to the south. The plane held together until Wilhelm slowed down to come in for a landing. Then he felt the controls simply ignoring his attempts. The landing deck officer saw the change in the aircraft and gave the signal to cut the engine much earlier than normal. Wilhelm did, and the plane responded by, more or less, flopping down on the deck. Luckily, it caught the arrestor wire and came to a stop. Upon further inspection, it was found that the port aileron rod was in two pieces, and several of the wing ribs were demolished. With his crooked smile that was part frown, part relief, Wilhelm knew that the entire adventure had been for nothing because his torpedo had missed its intended victim.
even before the second wave had reached Taranto. Aircraft L-5F, the plane that had sustained damage on deck, was being looked over. Pilot Clifford and observer going felt sick at not being able to join in the attack and begged for the impossible. They wanted the riggers and fitters to repair the two broken ribs and replace the torn fabric right now. The eager pilots were told that it was already 9.50 p.m. and that the second wave was gone. The flyers pressed forward with their pleas. They were then assured it could not be done in time, but the support staff would give it a try. Twenty minutes later, at 10.10, the plane seemed ready for takeoff. On deck, the commander in charge of flights gaped at the revived bird, but still didn't want to clear it for flight. There might be other damage not found. Clifford and Going begged again. Permission was hesitantly given. They took off and arrived at Taranto, only 24 minutes behind their comrades. As they got closer, the last of the swordfish was leaving, but the bullets, shells, and tracers still filled the night air. Circling the main harbor, there didn't seem to be a decent target that wasn't covered with heavy flak. Clifford then headed east to the smaller harbor. Soon the cruiser Trento was spotted, and Clifford dove the last 2,000 feet right at it. Dropping his six bombs, he then pulled up and headed away. However, there were no secondary explosions, and the two airmen felt that they had wasted everyone's time. In fact, one of their bombs had landed on the Trento, but failed to explode. However, a large hole was now in the cruiser and would have to be repaired. Back at the Illustrious and its surrounding escorts, everyone waited. There was nothing else to do. They all watched out for Italian ships or subs, but nothing showed. The plan called for the first wave to return and land at 1 a.m. So, at that time, the carrier turned into the wind and made 21 knots. Having practiced this over and over, those on the carrier expected the first wave to be already circling, waiting to land. But above, there was only silence, in the sky and on the radar screen. Finally, after 12 long minutes, the first swordfish blipped on the radar screen. Soon, all but one of the planes was detected. Everyone celebrated as word spread, one loss out of 12. It was not to be expected, or even hoped for. Of course, the question was, how much damage did they do? The pilots were peppered with questions, and answered as honestly as they could. And their replies did not lead their superiors to believe much in the way of significant damage was done to the Italian fleet. But even before they could get their stories out, the second attack wave was circling over the carrier, asking to land. They too soon had their aircraft next to the first wave in the hangar, and sadly, their stories of mixed successes matched those of the first wave. But everyone celebrated the second wave's loss of only a single plane. Everyone wanted the mission to succeed, but they also wanted their comrades back. So, so far, so good. The latter wish was granted, but again, what did they achieve? That could only be answered by the morning's light when the Bob Martins from Malta would fly over Taranto at dawn. By 3 a.m., the last swordfish was aboard and secured. The British vessels then formed up and headed south. One reason for this was to join up with Cunningham's fleet, the idea being safety in numbers. But tonight, they were willing to settle for deterrence in numbers. Also, it was deemed prudent to stay clear of land-based Italian bombers who would be looking for a little payback. As they joined up with Cunningham, his flagship was flying two pennants. One signaled, illustrious, maneuver well executed. The other flag signaled, all ships, repeat signal, admiral is now flying. The men from the attack force were tired, but proud as they witnessed the greatest compliment and honor in the British Navy, and it was all for them. 
The attack force brought back most of their men. They also brought back hope for the future. But Rear Admiral Leister, having just gone over his pilot's reports, wanted to go back that night for another attack. Cunningham wasn't so sure, but was open to being convinced. But then all was decided for them as a storm came up. Soon after, three Italian Cant Z-501 planes spotted the group, but before they could escape, were shot down by Fulmars, directed by radar. Against the Italians, Churchill's wizard war was proving everything he claimed it to be. Hey everyone, Ray here. History is replete with humans overcoming adversity. Yet one of the most horrific disasters, and those that it affected, has largely been forgotten, that being the Great Mississippi Flood. From Wondery, American History Tellers is a podcast that explores extraordinary events from our nation's past and brings them to life. And the story of the Great Mississippi Flood launches their new season. In the summer of 1926, the American Midwest experienced rainfall like no one could remember, and all that water had to go somewhere, that being the mighty Mississippi. By the time the rain stopped, some 27,000 square miles were underwater. Crops were destroyed, getting around was practically impossible, and hundreds of farms and entire communities had been washed away. This included now 600,000 homeless Americans and another thousand dead. And when you add on the racism, exploitation, and betrayal that followed, the American landscape would be changed forever. Listen to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. As the proposed follow-up attack would not be, Cunningham and his would have to settle for the results of the previous night's work. The Bob Martins were sent up early that day of November 12th. Flight Lieutenant Whiteley and his crew of Maryland's, or Bob Martin's, lifted off from Malta. Their orders were to fly near Corfu on the Greek coast and then head west. The idea was to come at Taranto from the east, a direction, hopefully, Taranto's no doubt heightened security wouldn't expect. Not being told of what happened the previous night, Whiteley and his crew were shocked to see how Mar Grande had altered. Getting over this, the observers started taking photos. But, as this information had to make it back, the radio operator from the lead plane summarized the scene below them and transmitted in code. But coded messages, especially short ones, could not fully explain the immense carnage, so Whiteley had a second message sent, this one longer, more descriptive, and uncoded. It wasn't like anything was going to change down there if they were overheard. Meanwhile, the Italians at Taranto, under the leadership of Admiral Riccardi, had been busy all night salvaging what could be saved, in terms of lives and ships. The literal's bow was submerged. The ship itself had three large ragged holes in it. Twenty-three men from her crew were now dead. As for the Cavour, she suffered 16 casualties. The crew tried to beach her, but the water was coming in faster than the pumps could take it out. And at 5.45 a.m., all attempts were given up. By dawn, she had settled on the harbor floor. The Duilio's number one and two magazines were flooded, and she was beached in time to save her from sinking. But one crewman died during the attack. Spilled oil had discolored the harbors. Smoke rose into the air. Fires were still being fought, and wreckage was everywhere. But in time, the Italians and British would discover the one weakness of attacking in a harbor versus the open sea. The Lotorio would be repaired and in service in just five months. The Duilio in six months. Even the Cavour would be refloated but not until July of 1941. However, she was still under repairs by the end of the war. None of this would have been possible from the ocean floor. 
As the Bob Martin photos were analyzed and Whiteley's crew testified to, the attack had been a great success. Italy's naval numbers were reduced and British morale was lifted. Exactly what Cunningham and his staff were after. The Italians learned a few things as well. Their ships were not safe in their best harbor that was close to the Mediterranean sea lanes. That same day, November 12th, the undamaged battleships Veneto and Cesar were sent to the harbor at Naples. They were deemed safer there, but now practically useless. After all, in a time of war, an unused weapon is a useless weapon. A black day was how Count Ciano, Mussolini's foreign minister, described the event in his diary. However, when he told Il Duce of the event, the dictator took the news better than his son-in-law supposed he would. It then dawned on the foreign minister that, perhaps, his leader did not quite grasp the gravity of the situation, and how this changed everyone's position in our sea. In Mussolini's defense, his focus was still on Greece, where our story will return next time. Epilogue The Battle of Taranto wasn't the end. It was only a beginning. A beginning the British desperately needed. But the Italian Navy would be back. Five days after Taranto, a large Italian fleet disrupted a sorely needed, they were all sorely needed, convoy to Malta. What followed was the indecisive battle of Cape Spartivento. Neither side scored a significant victory, but it showed that the Italian navy wasn't out of the running yet. In fact, control of the Mediterranean would swing back and forth until Italy was taken out of the war in 1943. Earlier in 1940, United States Navy Admiral Joseph Richardson, commander of the Pacific Fleet, questioned the sagacity of basing his fleet at Pearl Harbor to his superior, Admiral Harold Stark, chief of naval operations. Somewhat shocked, Stark replied that having the fleet based in that position was the whole point. It was to intimidate the Japanese from any sudden, foolhardy attack. But Richardson's concern was not abated by this, and so... Pulling a stunt every American, not in uniform, would appreciate, he went over his superior's head and bent the ear of President Roosevelt on October 8th during a lunch. The following month, within days of the attack on Taranto, Richardson was relieved of command of the Pacific Fleet and replaced with Admiral Husband Kimmel. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, now that Taranto is done, we'll be going back to the war in Greece, and we will stay with it until December the 9th when Operation Compass commences. Um, just another reminder that it's not too late to send in an email if you're interested or curious about the tour. We're still getting the package together. Got a couple more emails uh, last week or so, so thank you very much for that. And I'd like to just very quickly thank the newest members to the podcast. Um, Timothy, Philip, David, Andrew, Gareth, um, Steve, Jerome, Roger, Andrew, Bruce, Connor, Stuart, Darren, and Guan. Thank you all very much again. And just to let you know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have the episode ready before March 1st. And if I do, I'll just release it. So please keep checking the website. As for my Audible recommendation, please consider The Vatican Pimpernel, the World War II exploits of the Monsignor who saved over 6,500 lives. Yes, it's a long title, but it's basically the story about Irishman Monsignor Hugh O'Flannery, who uh, had an escape organization when the Germans occupied Rome from 42 to 44. They helped Allied POWs and civilians, including Jews, and they did everything they could for the oppressed. Occasionally, O'Flannery would dress in disguise and go outside of the Vatican to try to help people to save, and by the time it's all done, they saved over 6,000 lives. 
And the story does a good job of describing the relationship, if you can call it that, between O'Flattery and Herbert Kepler, who was the Gestapo agent in Rome who was uh, who actually ordered his execution. So obviously that doesn't work. And um, after the war, the Gestapo chief actually um, begged his forgiveness and has asked him to um, baptize him. So he really came around full circle. It's a it's an amazing story if you're if you're interested in what goes on behind the, the war lines, and I think you'll find it very interesting. And it's written by Brian Fleming. So I'll see you as soon as I can in episode 73. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything that's going on in Greece between November the 11th and December the 9th. We might have to do a couple of episodes and then we'll get to Operation Compass as soon as we can. Take care, everyone.